Well, Admiral, it's on track because last night House Democrats saved those packages of foreign aid bills proposed by Speaker Mike Johnson, which contain aid to Israel and Ukraine. In a rare move, all four Democrats on the House Rules Committee joined the five Republicans in passing a procedural vote that allows the bills to advance to the House floor for a vote. Usually it is the majority party alone that passes these rules in committee and on the floor. The Democratic votes were needed because three Republicans on that committee voted against the bills in protests that aid for Ukraine was not paired with border security measures. In an interview last night, Speaker Johnson acknowledged the rebellion within his own party from a small faction and admitted he will need those Democrats to get his aid packages passed this weekend. We have continued to work every single day. We've passed resolutions. But again, remember what we said at the outset. We only control one chamber, and I barely have control of that. I can't. The Senate won't advance our legislation, and the president won't sign it. He won't fulfill his obligations. So why is the border not in this package? Because, Greta, we didn't have the votes to do it. I have a handful of my Republicans, at least, who will not advance a rule to bring that to the floor to combine it with the Ukraine and Israel funding. They won't do it. And so if I don't have Republican votes, that means we have to have Democrat votes. So, Michael Steele, kind of an explosive scene on Capitol Hill yesterday when that small group of Republicans who don't want any aid going out the door, some of them at all, others saying we don't want it without border security measures. Although, remember, let's say for the, I don't know, thousandth time that there was a comprehensive bipartisan border package <laughs> sent over from the Senate. We'll put that to the side for a moment. What do you make, make of Speaker Johnson just in these last couple of days, really, sort of standing up to the hard right MAGA members of his caucus and saying we're going to get this money to Ukraine and he wants this vote to happen by Saturday. Well, it says to me a, a number of interesting things, but the, I think the top line is that he's he's come to the conclusion that, yeah, he may have to sacrifice his speakership to get something done. Um, he recognizes the importance of this moment, that all of the, the loud noise from his right flank uh, still does not solve the problem that's in front of him and the country. And that is, what do we do about aid to Ukraine? What do we do about assistance on, uh, to Israel? What do we do uh, in a number of these other hot spots? Most importantly, of course, Ukraine. And so that reality is set in. The other part of it mm -hmm. is I think he recognizes that he has been uh, the dog that has been wagged by the Marjorie Taylor Greene tail. And, and she's the one who's driven a large part of this. There's, I was talking to some folks just this earlier this week. There is a frustration with the way that she is sort of manhandled, uh, the, the speaker, uh, in this matter, giving him very little room. Uh, to 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 negotiate, putting it such, making it so much harder um, to to get the piece that they really wanted, which is the connection of border security to Ukraine. Even though, as we noted, we've been here before and they had the deal. Um, the fact of the matter is, a lot of folks were a little bit tired of that, um, and I think if he saw that opening. Uh, and the speaker decided to move into it. He went to the leadership on the other side, to Hakeem Jeffries, talked to the Democrats on the committee, and has now f finally been able to carve out that space to move this, this initiative forward. And we'll see the votes this weekend. So bravo to the speaker. Um, he recognized that his speakership was worth sacrificing for the country. Uh, yeah, I, you, you know, um, it, 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 it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and... Michael still was talking about it, where you, you have people that are pushing back against the speaker. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting dynamic. You can get away with that for only so long. And, and I, I know because we were constantly pushing against Newt Gingrich to get more, get more, get more when we were trying to get the, the, the budget balanced. And you can push to a certain degree. And at some point, you, you blow up the legislative process enough to get what you want and everybody turns against you. And I think that's what we're seeing here, uh, that, that there are a lot of people that have just had, had enough uh, at, at, at a couple of backbenchers uh, that are controlling what they do when it comes to Ukraine funding. And it looks like the speaker, uh, who certainly should be applauded, I will say, uh, for what he's now saying about Ukraine, what he's now saying about the United States' role in the world, something that Joe Biden's been saying for a really long time. I'm glad he's saying it. Also glad that 
we're getting to a point where a lot of these backbenchers, um, you know, are, are what what they're doing is going to amount to sound and fury signifying nothing because they're going to get rolled. And Nika, as far as this lie goes about, oh, uh, well, we can't pass Ukraine funding until we take care of our own border. Oh, come on. We took care of our own border. Yeah. You had James Langford, Joe Biden. You, you, you had you had Republicans in the Senate all coming together for the strongest bill they would have got strongest bill ever. More than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters were arrested on the campus of Columbia University yesterday. It came just one day after the school's president was questioned by lawmakers on Capitol Hill about incidents of anti-Semitism on school grounds. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton reports. <laughs> Confrontation at Columbia police removing protesters from campus. Citing extraordinary circumstances, Columbia University President Manu Shafiq called in the NYPD to clear an encampment of pro-Palestinian student demonstrators. The encampment set up Wednesday morning, the same day Shafiq testified on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on campus. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. In a letter to the university community, Shafiq noted, protests have a storied history at Columbia, where anti-Vietnam demonstrators took over buildings on campus in 1968. But in asking for help from the police, she said, the encampment and related disruptions pose a clear and present danger to the substantial functioning of the university. We are risking like our academic standing just to like show the administrators that we are not okay with their decisions. Several demonstrators today stomping on an Israeli flag. Some students saying they feel unsafe on campus. I feel as though um, people are kind of weaponizing um, anti-Semitism. Demonstrators telling us they plan to keep their protests going despite the police presence. Do you feel like this administration has clamped down on students and faculty members' free speech? 100 percent, yes. I do believe that. New York City's mayor saying police made more than 100 arrests on a campus severely divided. NBC's Antonia Hilton reporting from Columbia University in New York. So, Joe, yesterday uh, you saw another case uh, in a several in recent weeks where heads of school, chancellors, administrators have said there is a line now between free speech. We've allowed you to protest. We've allowed you to go to certain places. We've opened up dialogues right. on our campus, given you a place to have these debates. But when it comes to harassment of Jewish students, when it comes to interrupting the operations of, say, a class or a speaker or people moving through the campus, we're now saying you can't do that anymore. Or, or, yeah, exactly. I mean, whether you're talking about the, the, the interruption of the functioning of the Golden Gate Bridge or uh, the, the normal functioning of Columbia University, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's too much. It's too much. You, you can have free speech without, uh, again, stopping the normal functioning of, of these institutions. Um, and it's, it's really unfortunate uh, that they'll, you'll have people stepping forward saying, well, this is we have to do this because Israel is so terrible. Israel is this, that. You know, and, and look what's happening to the Palestinian people. But I just didn't see these protests when 10,000, 30,000, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 Arabs were killed in Syria in Assad's civil war. Did, did we see this when Saddam Hussein was killing a million Muslims? I didn't see the protests. And, and so uh, the protests have a time and a place. And... And nobody should trample on First Amendment uh, rights of people who want to support the Palestinian cause or want to support Israel's cause. But, but that's not the way it's going on college campuses. Right now, it has been overwhelmingly one-sided. And it's not just Jewish students who are feeling the pressure. Uh, it, it's, it's also other students that are feeling the pressure to take extreme positions, anti-Israel positions. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm glad the president of Columbia University has stepped forward. You know, 
Some people may call allowing students to take over president's offices at Columbia in the 1960s a storied tradition. I don't. I call that anarchy. Like, if you're a president of a university and you're letting students take over your office, maybe maybe you should seek employment elsewhere because I guarantee you there are a lot of parents that send their children to schools who don't want students running the place. They like grown-ups to run the place, and it looks like that's what's happening in Columbia. Yeah, and I'll speak for, you know, I went to Vanderbilt University. They've had a lot of this on their campus in recent weeks, and a group of students a couple of weeks ago pushed their way into Kirkland Hall where the chancellor's office is. They pushed aside an unarmed security guard. They sat there for 20 yeah. hours doing exactly yeah, what no. you're talking about, Joe. And Chancellor Deermeyer, uh, who runs Vanderbilt, ultimately said, okay, you're all suspended, and then one by yeah. one reviewed their cases and expelled three of the students and said, Good. we've given you a place to have free speech. We've given you a place to protest. We've given you a place to voice your opinion. We've created symposiums where both sides of this uh, discussion can be heard. You didn't participate in that, but you broke into our office and sat here. So three of you are now no longer students at Vanderbilt wow. University. And that was one of the first schools actually to do that. And I think you've seen more of it now since then. Jeremy Peters, the national reporter for The New York Times, is writing about this. He's got new reporting on how those administrators are now responding to a surge in anti-Israel protests on campus. Also with us, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. His group is out with new data on anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in the last year. Good morning to you both. Jeremy, I'll begin with you. Uh, it does seem to have been, just in the last couple of weeks even, a bit of a change in the approach that some, not all, that some leaders of campuses, of universities across the country are taking with these protests. What did you find in your reporting? That's exactly right, Willie. Schools have had enough. And Vanderbilt issued what are believed to be the first expulsions of student protesters related to demonstrations stemming from the uh, October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. And from Vanderbilt to NYU to Columbia to the University of Michigan to Pomona, schools uh, are saying basically, look, this is not about free speech. You have a right to speak up. You have a right to demonstrate. What you don't have is a right to his harass and disrupt. And that's what's really um, been impeding these universities' core mission, which is to educate your students. And you can't have uh, a, an environment that is constantly disrupted where students are, are subject to harassment, where they're, they're spit upon, where they're yelled at, where graduation ceremonies or like the, the, the incident I wrote about um, at my alma mater, the University of Michigan, this honors convocation that was supposed to be this, this kind of lovely celebratory uh, moment where kids who are the highest achieving students are honored, their parents and grandparents are there. And what happened? It got disrupted and had to be shut down early because uh, 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 pro-Palestinian protesters were standing up and shouting down speakers and unfurling banners. And this is something I think universities have been slow to acknowledge. I mean, remember during the Trump years, universities really became uh, this, this, this cauldron of protest activity where um, this kind of overly censorious culture developed, where if there was a speaker who was, you know, conservative or aligned with Trump, um, instead of letting that person speak, uh, a lot of times the speech would be canceled out of fear for the safety of that speaker or people would interrupt the speaker. And, and now, you know, I think universities are saying we didn't do enough to rein that in, but now they are. Well, I mean, you know, it, and the thing is, that's happened over the past couple of years, but this has been a problem for a long time. I'll just say it, brats who are protesting when say Christine Lagarde tries to speak at a graduation or Condi Rice tries to speak at a graduation or I think even Christine Todd Whitman one time was canceled mm -hmm. from speaking at the graduation I gotta say you're either the adult running the right. campus or you're the child right. that is incapable of controlling students the students are there to learn that means all the students are there to learn not just students who decide this one issue is the most important issue to them. And I certainly understand if Gaza is the most important issue, especially to Palestinian students in America. But it goes well beyond that. You can't shut down an entire campus 
Your right to free speech doesn't mean your right to impinge upon everybody else's free speech and their ability to function in right. a university setting. Omnist for Politico, Jonathan Martin, his latest piece is entitled Trump the Front Runner? Not so fast. Explain what you're seeing playing out right now, Jonathan. Hey, Mika, I just think that the, the Trump is going to win or Trump's a lot conventional wisdom got a little out of hand the last couple of months. I think there's frankly some overcompensation from people who uh, aren't Trump fans but want to seem like they get it. That they're 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 in touch with real America, kind of unlike perhaps they weren't in 2016. Uh, but the, 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 this assumption that he's a sure thing kind of doesn't fully factor in that Donald Trump is Donald Trump and he's going to say and do things that are, that are going to be uh, detrimental to his own cause. And he's got an aptitude for self-sabotage, unlike any politician that we know. And that this is a sort of campaign that still has six months to go and a lot can happen. Uh, there's known unknowns and there's unknown unknowns. And uh, the idea that, that, that this is inevitable, Trump's coming back for a second term, I just don't think uh, is reflected in the data or the reality of Donald Trump, the politician we know. So, so Jay Mark, mm. Michael Steele here. Um, I, I, I found that 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 headline uh, an interesting one. Um, that you know, Trump may not necessarily be the front runner. You're, you're talking about in terms of the 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 race between him and Biden, or inside yeah. the party? Because I don't. Who's who's taking this this guy down inside the party? I think everyone's lined up. So yeah, who who? If he's not the front runner, who is? No, in terms of the race between he and Biden, I mean. Okay, I mean, cool. All right, I just want because I was like front runner. No, yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean tr Trump clearly is the dominant figure in the GOP. He has been for almost nine years now. That, that, that's unquestioned. Look, there's obviously a third of the Republican Party, the old guard, maybe some folks on this very show right now, Joe Scarborough, who are embarrassed <laughs> by Trump, who find Trump to be be uh, you know an appalling figure. But it's math. The one third is vastly outnumbered by the two thirds, and so. Trump clearly controls the GOP. But guys, he's always been a minority uh, political leader. He's never sniffed 50% of the vote in either election. And obviously, he's presided over losses up and down the ballot in his own party since 2017. So the idea that he's some political colossus is not reflected, obviously, uh, I don't think, in history or in the data today. Now, we all get it. This is an election of six states. Biden's coalition is tenuous. Biden's numbers are really bad, and he's going to have a huge challenge. But I just don't think the idea that, um, you know, David Cameron going to Mar-a-Lago, like, that wouldn't happen unless this conventional wisdom hadn't set in that Trump's a sure thing, you know. And, and Jamar, President Duda just two days ago met with Donald Trump, Trump in Tower. New York because yeah. Donald Trump is obviously here uh, sitting for that trial. Uh, yeah. So what is your sense of the, the truth about the way the Trump campaign feels about this? Obviously, they always project confidence that we yeah. are the front runner. We're going to beat Joe Biden. Do they worry that as these trials go on, as we've seen in the last week, Donald Trump just kind of sitting powerless in a courtroom with more to come? Do they concern that that cuts into some of that confidence that they're projecting that they worry about it? Yeah. Yeah. And just real fast, by the way, I'm the, 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 the Duda meeting at Trump Tower. Uh, I had a Western official tell me that the Trump world has actually encouraged the embassies to have uh, foreign leaders go visit Trump on his turf. So this is an active effort by Trump's advisors to get these foreign leaders to go see him because they like the image. They know what the image projects, Willie. Um, look, there's no question that, 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 that the Trump campaign can only control so much, right? They have a candidate who is really somebody who's going to do what he's going to do and say what he's going to say. So they have limitations in what they can do. If you saw the letter this week of him trying to create, Willie, his own NIL, a 5% cut, as they say in Philadelphia, getting a taste, um, you know, that kind of thing where you're trying to get a cut of down-ballot candidates who use Donald Trump's image in an ad is not the effort of a campaign that's trying to put together an organization in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. It's an organization that's trying to placate Donald Trump and 
and pick up some cash while they're doing it. So I think a lot mm -hmm. of their time, Willie, is focused on keeping Mr. Trump happy. And when you're doing that, you're not putting together a winning campaign. Well, and he's just got to be miserable having to sit in court all day. So good luck. Tr Good luck trying to keep him happy. One can uh, imagine. Senior, <laughs> I, I don't even know what that's like. Uh, senior political columnist for Politico, Jonathan Martin, thank you so much. Always Thanks, good to Megan. have you on. I guess their reasoning is they they want Russia to win so badly that they want to house the speaker over it. I mean, that's a, it's a strange position to take. Um, and, uh, you know, I think... It's, uh, I think they want to be in the minority, too. I think mean, that's an obvious reality. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one way of putting it. Republican uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, Texas. Russia to win so badly. Yeah. It's a strange position to take. It's a very bizarre position. Take, Don't really again, get it. Again, why, why do you have people from rural districts uh, parroting Vladimir Putin's talking points? Very oh, strange. I don't very understand. strange. Anyhow, he's criticizing members of his own party. Acting strange, threatening to remove Speaker Mike Johnson over funding for Ukraine. David French and Susan Glasser are still with us. Susan's latest piece for The New Yorker is entitled, Did Mike Johnson Just Get Religion on Ukraine? Well, Susan, it certainly looks that way, does it not? What I mean, happened? he's quoting Ronald Reagan. He's saying all he this sort of things. David French and I have been saying for years and have been wondering why he hasn't been saying for six months now. You know, the hour is late. Let's just say that for Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's already a disaster on the front lines because of this months long delay by Republicans and by Mike Johnson. Uh, so for him to come out the other day, it was almost this like out of body experience. He was talking as if, you know, he was a Republican from the before times. Uh, and you can only imagine that Donald Trump was not happy to hear Mike Johnson talking about. He used the phrase axis of evil. He said, I believe leave the intelligence. Uh, I was very struck by that line after years of Republicans, you know, tearing down the credibility of American intelligence agencies just following Trump. Uh, you know, he said very explicitly, uh, if we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, he will uh, roll further, perhaps into the Balkans or against Poland or another NATO ally. This was like an out of body experience for Mike Johnson, who, by the way, as a rank and file, nobody in Congress uh, voted voted against all previous Ukraine uh, assistance packages. And so, you know, what does it mean? Let's, I, I do think it's important. He's obviously not a resistance hero yet, uh, <laughs> Joe, right? He is um, endorsing Donald Trump. In the end, Ukraine's fate, it, it hinges not on this $60 billion, which is crucial right now, but on what happens in the U.S. election this fall, I think. Right. You know, when you're a backbencher and you're just worried about your district, that's one thing. Uh, when you actually, uh, David French, are Speaker of the House and you get briefings and you, you get intel briefings and you suddenly understand that FISA is needed to stop the next Islamic uh, radical attack on the United States or, uh, or, or the next attack from some other uh, force outside the United States, Suddenly, it, it, it's quite sobering, uh, but it is interesting what, what uh, Susan just said, that he sounded like a Republican from the before times. He sounded, David, like one of us. And in fact, he was saying exactly what we've been saying here and what you've been saying over the past several months. Look, I applaud it. I applaud it. And I think a Same couple here. of things were happening. I think a couple of things were happening at once. One, the situation on the ground in Ukraine was becoming obvious to everyone. There was no ambiguity here on the urgent necessity of American aid to keep Russia from winning this war. The other thing that was happening is his hard right flank was just getting crazier and crazier. He began to realize, I think, and he should have known it a long time ago, he's not dealing with serious people. He's not dealing with people who have both eyes on American national security. He's dealing with a fringe that is just lost to conspiracy land. And so you just cannot govern a country kowtowing to that faction. And look, the, seeing the rise of a kind of a coalition arrangement in the House is good for the United States of America. It's good for this country when we have bipartisan legislation 
that protects American allies and protects American national security. This is one of those no-brainer pieces of legislation in many ways that was being held up by some of the weirdest, wildest, craziest, and you almost hate to call them arguments in American public life. Just wild propaganda was holding up this aid. And it, I think at long last he realized he's not really Speaker of the House, not really if he's beholden to Marjorie Taylor Greene. So this is where yeah. he decides he has to be Speaker of the House he's, if he's going to hold that position. If Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to take him on, let her do her worst. And I think this is not just an important moment for Ukraine, for Israel, for Taiwan. It was a very important moment for American governance. And I've known Mike Johnson for many years and I've had many disagreements with Mike Johnson in recent years. But this is the Mike Johnson that I knew a long time ago. This is a Mike Johnson, a man who had real principles, and I was very glad to see it. Oh, the New York Times columnist David French and the New Yorker's Susan Glasser, thank you both. And David, we were very happy to have Nancy on the other day, the better half. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry you down, I'm sorry you ghosted. downgraded to me. I'm sorry you downgraded to me. <laughs> She's amazing. All right. Thanks for coming on this morning. The Biden administration is facing pressure to help secure the release of a Princeton doctoral student being held hostage in the Middle East. There was a protest outside the White House on Monday as President Biden was meeting with the Iraqi prime minister. The group was trying to bring attention to the kidnapping of 37-year-old Elizabeth Surkov. She's a dual Israeli-Russian citizen who was studying in Baghdad last year when she was taken by a terrorist group who's backed by the Iranian government. Before his meeting with the prime minister on Monday, the State Department said President Biden would raise the issue with the Iraqi leader. And of course, we will be following this story. Over one decade ago, American freelance journalist James Foley was covering the civil war in Syria when he was kidnapped by ISIS. He was held captive for two years, then executed by the terrorist group on camera in 2014. Seven years later, his mother, Diane Foley, traveled to a Virginia courthouse to speak with one of his, her son's imprisoned captors and to find answers. She has a new book on those meetings entitled American Mother, and she joins us now. We want to thank you very much for uh, coming on the show this morning. Um, let us know what, what you learned in some of those meetings. I know it, it's all in the book, and, and it's, it's a journey for you even after your son's death that is incredibly compelling. Um, give us a sense of, of parts of that journey. I, uh, well, good morning to you both. It's good to um, be with you again. Last time I saw you was shortly after Jim was killed. So I thank yeah. you for your time. No, it was, it was necessary to talk to Alexander Cody for me because Jim would have. Jim was always interested mm -hmm. in the underdog and folks that um, might um, be disenfranchised. And I think Alexander, as a young immigrant without a dad, you know, um, was bullied and Jim would have wanted to hear him out. So I, I felt it was necessary to go speak to him. Um, and I, I think we have to listen and find ways to talk to those we don't agree with. Um, so that was a lot of the reason. Plus, I wanted to tell him about Jim. I wanted him to know who Jim was as a person. Hmm. Diane, so good morning. It's Willie Geis. This extra extraordinary book. Um, um, so you spent three days uh, at Virginia Courthouse uh, talking with this man, which I'm sure took a lot to sit down and, and look him in the eye and find some humanity and some mercy even. Um, can you take us inside the conversations? What was it like on a human level? Well, to be honest, I had to, I, I had to pray to just be really present and see him as the young man that he is, um, really the same age as one of our younger sons, who's obviously made some awful choices, um, you know, and it's important that he be held accountable. But by the same token, um, he also has lost his freedom and probably ability to ever see his family or country again. So the whole experience was sad, but healing in the sense that 
uh, he heard me, and I feel that I, I heard him. Um, and he did express quite a bit of remorse, to be honest. Diane Elise Jordan here. Your empathy and your courage has just been incredible and is so inspiring. And, you know, the book I'm so excited to read, but how much in the book do you talk about what you did to change how American hostages are rescued by the American government? Because part of the frustration with your son's struggle was that the U.S. government really did not step up to the plate. And they even harmed your efforts and threatened you with prosecution if you and your husband pursued outside action. So you have changed. Now there's a hostage coordinator. So many rescues have been possible. So many hostages have been released. How did, just can you talk about how you, how you did that? Well, that is Jim's legacy, and that does give me um, joy in many ways. Um, when Jim was taken in 2012 through 2014, there was no U.S. hostage enterprise. There was no one to help me. So that was part of the reason I was sent in circles, and um, people didn't know. Our government did not know what to do with me, actually. Um, and I was ignorant of our policy of non engagement with captors um, because obviously if you don't engage at all um, the captors will get rid of the hostages and kill them and that's what happened with Jim um, Kayla Mueller Peter Kasich and Stephen Sotloff in 2014 so I was angry I felt as a country we could do much better and thanks to many good people we have we now have a US hostage enterprise with dedicated government officials who brought home more than 100 U.S. nationals, people who were targeted like Jim, free of any crime, I'm free of, you know, had not committed any crime at all, but were targeted because they were Americans, and more than 100 have been brought home. But it's still a huge national security threat in, in a all honesty. It's a challenge to us because Americans are targeted when we travel internationally. We truly are. The book, the book is titled American Mother, and it is available yeah. now. Diane Foley, thank you very much uh, thank you for, for writing this time. book and for coming on the show this morning. You can find more information by clicking on jamesfoleyfoundation.org. And once again, thank you so much. Still ahead. John Heilman, uh, new Fox News polls are out of registered voters in swing states. And really tells the same story that we've been hearing over the past week or two, a tightening of the race. All four of the states within the margin of error. Donald Trump leads Georgia 51-45. That may be outside the margin of error there. Uh, Michigan 49-46. Again, those numbers in both of those states tightening up. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania dead heats 48-48. So again, a tightening race. Uh, as we move from April into May. Yeah, I mean, Joe, I, if, if, given, if I were given my druthers, uh, I would, I know we, we have to report on polls, uh, but, but I would, to your point about the margin of error, I, I'm, I'm sort of my gut at, at this point and my head both say that uh, we'd all be wise to essentially uh, not really care that much about, about new polls unless they start to show a race that's outside the margin of error, because yeah. My, my, my sense of this race and is, is that all the data we have is that we are going to have a margin of error race in the battleground states uh, from now until Election Day. And, and the margin of error means that there's a margin of error. And so these numbers are, in some sense, meaningless other than to say this race is really close. And we know that. Right. I, I think the I, I think that the, the mar tiny size of tightening in either direction don't matter very much. And I do think that that anybody who was sitting here on a Friday and said, who had a better week? Uh, in, in politically, uh, Joe Biden in a, in, a, in a battleground state a lot of the week in Pennsylvania uh, or Donald Trump in court. Well, you think I know what the I think yeah. we all know what the answer to that is. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it is interesting that that over the past six months or so, the courtroom politics have played in Donald Trump's favor. I am curious. So now, Claire, that we are seeing um, Joe Biden campaigning and, and, and Donald Trump uh, stuck in stuck in a courtroom uh, over the next 
six to eight weeks, whether those dynamics change a bit. And also, I just I just got to say, uh, when I was in public office, I don't know about you, I never cared about the bottom line of the poll. I just obsessed on trend lines. Where was the last one? Where was the one before that? And there's an unmistakable trend post State of the Union address that breaks in Joe Biden's favor, whether it's public polling or private polling. Yeah, I agree with both you and John. I think the trend is good. I also think margin of error polls are really uh, kind of a waste of time. What I would love is for all of these polling folks to just focus on independent voters, um, voters who have voted for both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, or people who are in those congressional districts in those swing states that have elected both Republicans and Democrats. If the, it's very expensive to poll those voters, those swing voters, but those are the only voters at play right now. Yes, they've got to worry about enthusiasm and getting bases out. Our party, the Democratic Party, my party, has to really worry about solidifying the coalitions and making sure they understand the importance of voting. But it's those voters that go back and forth that are going to decide these states. They don't really get polled in a way that, they, that you can see it because it's so expensive to do it, to find enough of them to make the polls reliable costs a lot of money. So none of these folks that are polling want to do that. You know, I'm also fascinated by men, by men who voted for Biden, but who are conservative, who are Republican, are they going to stay with Biden this next go round or are they going to go back? So I, a lot of these men were influenced by abortion and about what they saw happening to women and they chose to jump ship. But has have the last four years been palatable for them. And so I'm curious to see if Biden's going to be able to hold on to that crucial little sliver and win re-election. Speaking right now, the ranking member of the House Intel Committee, Democratic Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut. Congressman, thanks so much for being with us. I mean, you know, if, if uh, from a distance you look at what's been going on and you have the Iranians who, who, who launched attacks at Israel, probably understanding they weren't going to be able to get through the Iron Dome and through all the defenses, but they did it. Uh, a barrage of, of drones and missiles a, uh, a couple of nights ago. And now you have Israel uh, doing uh, a more limited strike back. But the, the message is unmistakable, isn't it? From Israel to Iran, which is you can't, you can't touch us with with hundreds and hundreds of missiles and drones, you can't touch us, but we can reach you. We can reach your nuclear facilities at will. Yeah, I think that's right, Joe, uh, and good to be with you. Um, you know, what's happening right now is, is communication. It's deadly serious communication because it's being, you know, munitions are being used, lethal munitions are being used. But, you know, um, this is a moment where it's a classic Middle East moment in a way where, you know, everybody believes that everybody else only understands the language of force. So if an attack goes unanswered, well, that's a sign of weakness. And the next thing you know, the next attack is going to be much Worse, And, you know, the people who think that way are not entirely wrong. The Middle East is a very dangerous region. But this is a very dangerous moment. And I hope you're right. I hope that what Israel did last night, which was measured, is the last volley in this tit for tat. Because all it takes is, you know, one munition to get through to a civilian area to kill a dozen people in either country. And guess what? Now we're in a full-blown war, which is nothing like what we have been seeing. When Iran decides to do this in a very serious way, guess what? Hundreds of thousands of missiles from Hezbollah are flying into Israel. Iran actually has a quite capable military, the raid the other day notwithstanding. And that is a war that almost, first of all, is tragic for the people involved. And there's a very high probability that we get pulled into it. So, I mean, I've been saying this for days now, but now is the time for both sides to just stand down and focus on what is already a tragic situation in, in the Israel-Gaza conflict. Congressman, have you been briefed yet on what kind of munitions were used in this strike? Were these uh, ballistic missiles or drones? Do you have any new information about that? I have not been briefed on what Israel used. We're getting a sense for what the targets were. Um, again, it was not a massive strike. I think uh, Joe is right that this was designed to show if we want to, we can get stuff through to your military bases. So I'm glad we had that conversation, but now it is time to stop that conversation and focus on what is already a fairly catastrophic situation in the Israel-Gaza conflict. 
Uh, let me ask you, Congressman, about Ukraine uh, aid. Well, not just Ukraine aid, but aid for Israel, aid for Gaza, for a, a, aid for Taiwan as well. Um, it, it seems that the speaker has found his voice. He's sounding like we say Ronald Reagan. He's also sounding like Joe Biden and a lot of Democrats have sounded over the last last six months or so. Um, do you think uh, do you think that at the end of the day, these four bills end up passing? Uh, I do. I do. And I agree with you. It, it, you know, and it's really been two months that this has been so tragic because it was two months ago or so that the Senate passed almost exactly the same bill in a slightly different form. But 60 billion for Ukraine, you know, 15 billion for Israel, money for humanitarian okay. relief in Gaza. Um, that happened two months ago. And, you know, Ukrainians are dead today because the House of Representatives uh, decided to wait two months to act. You know, the Russian Putin uh, was, you know, his his whole sort of worldview was validated that we would waver, that we would be week. And believe me, he's not the only one who noticed that. So, yes, Joe, I do think they're going to pass. If you're me and you work in this institution, it's kind of fun because it's the restoration of, um, you know, majority rule in the House. You know, you've got a handful of people who have caused this problem, and you're going to see these bills pass, not only pass, but pass with a very substantial majority, which is theoretically the way the House of Representatives and our democracy is supposed to work. Yeah. All right. Ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Congressman Jim Himes, thank you very much. We'll see what happens. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.